Welcome, bienvenidos to everyone to um, our Committee of the Whole for June 20th. Um, we will start with roll call. Director Barros? Here. Director Decker? Here. Director Smith? Here. Director Sproul? Here. And I am also here. We're all in attendance and we have quorum. I will now turn this over to our superintendent, Dr. Snow. Thank you, Director Zavala Ortega. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, on this last day of school, uh, we're glad uh, that you're joining us either live or uh, watching the recording of the Committee of the Whole meeting. Uh, we are uh, going to review, preview, I guess, uh, information for the July 11th regular board meeting. Um, and so we'll go through contracts. And because of the graduation season in June, we've combined kind of the committee of the whole in a study session to one night because you as directors were very busy at um, graduations the last couple of weeks. There weren't a whole lot of nights to have a meeting. Um, and so we do have an update from our PLC team today as well. And we're joined um, by Carrie, Keith and Jim um, to uh, kind of give you all an update, answer any questions that you have about that. And then we'll turn it over to Brett um, to review the agenda for the 11th and answer any questions, either if you have now or also collect questions um, that we can prepare for the July 11th meeting. Uh, and then we'll take a short recess and then we do have a, a strategic planning workshop that is in the Bates um, Center where our viewing center is tonight for this um, meeting live as well. Um, and the public is welcome to join us um, for that part of the agenda. Um, and uh, then we'll hopefully conclude tonight. So kind of a busy night, busy day with the last day of school and really grateful for our family, students and staff on the completion of the 22-23 school year. There's always a lot packed into that year and um, lots of highlights and lots of challenges and opportunities to overcome things as well as, we, as we're so fortunate to serve our community's children. So um, with that, um, would you like me to pull up the slides for the PLC and just drive those? Okay, and then I'll just listen for you all to, to cue us on uh, when we're gonna move advance. So, so just give me a moment. Is everybody seeing the slides all right? Yeah. Jim, are you starting us off? Looks like we might have lost Jim. Yeah, I wonder if he might be frozen. I'm happy to step in to keep things moving. And then if he's able to calibrate, we can bring him back in. That sounds great. Thank you, Carrie. Yeah, no problem, no problem. Is there additional content um, for this opening slide? Bless you, thank you. So um, good evening again, my name is Carrie Van Ostren. I'm um, current VEA president and anticipating transition, but grateful to be a part of this VEA VPS collaboration and for another chance to update the school board and community as to um, kind of recentering our focus, what we've achieved this school year and where we're headed into next school year as well. So you'll recognize some of these goals, um, especially if you've joined us for previous um, study sessions, but our revisit to the professional learning communities approach is a five year rollout. Um, and so we've successfully completed year one of five and the impetus behind it was both in alignment with equity policy, but also in an effort to bolster our district wide system of what professional learning communities look like, not just narrowed to the classroom or collaborative team experience that we see at a building level. And um, by anchoring essential teams at the superintendent school board, district level, building level, and then classroom level. The intention is to be able to model ourselves at the district level, the type of collaborative process we'd like to see at building, classroom, and uh, superintendent board level as well. And then to ensure that we have two-way communication systems throughout those four levels in an effort to keep folks on the same page and make sure that decision-making is informed by key stakeholders. And um, this is not only focused on 
student growth, student data, and the student experience from an academic standpoint primarily, but it's also geared towards empowering and building up the professional experience for educators to ensure that they are as prepared as possible to meet the um, range of needs that our students bring um, and make sure that we leverage their assets in the process as well. Next slide, please. Thank you. And then these uh, specific goal areas, again, you're intimately familiar with, um, come from our VPS equity policy. And um, we, at the district level guiding coalition, um, try to reinforce that as our center point, our anchor point, or our North Star, as you see illustrated here, because the work of professional learning communities captures a broad range of the same goal areas um, anchored in equity policy. So again, there's still a reference to student learning clearly, and um, it helps us bolster the curriculum and evidence-based instructional practices that we're utilizing. Um, some of the progress monitoring work that's already taken place at the board level is reflected here. And then um, the sense of belonging is making sure that we are addressing both student and staff needs in this process as well. Next slide, please. Um, this evening is extra, um, it's an extra honor to be able to share this space, not only um, with Jim Gray, our district level counterpart, but Keith Lloyd, a colleague from Alki Middle School is joining us as well. And Keith is both um, a contributor to our district level guiding coalition and Keith has been identified as the building level guiding coalition co-lead who's partnering with his building administrator to build up their guiding coalition around um, alki specific needs supports and collaboration headed into next school year so um, keith and i will kind of tag team some of the context in the next round of slides so you don't just have to hear from me <laughs> this evening um, but we wanted to make sure to give some reflection and celebration around some of the successes that we found this first year of five implementing our um, kind of rehash or revisit of the professional learning communities process. So at the school board and superintendent level, we're grateful to Kyle Sproul for traveling to the PLC summit this year to build up school board context, understanding and capacity when it comes to um, district wide professional learning communities and the group that we sent was a cross representation, including both administrators and educators, and again, reinforcing the VEA VPS partnership. Um, we'll talk a little bit about that intention heading forward, but um, appreciate your patience and flexibility to leverage existing assessment tools like iReady to support the progress monitoring process. And we'll dive a little bit deeper into what common formative assessment development might look like through our five year journey in an effort to give you a better, um, more intimate and accurate picture of student progress um, that's more like classroom based or school based. Um, but again, celebrating the ability to progress monitor in our first year of implementation, knowing that we're headed in um, other directions as well. And then grateful again for this space to be able to um, communicate directly with board directors and superintendent in addition to a couple of other check-ins that Jim and I have shared with Dr. Snell over the course of the school year as well in an effort to make sure that y'all are hearing the input we're receiving from building and district um, level guiding coalitions, and then to help address priority areas or questions that you might have to bring down through the remainder of the system as well. So thank you again for helping us um, celebrate that aspect of our uh, year one implementation. And then at the district level guiding coalition, so that's a combination of educators, principals, and um, district level personnel. We've um, anchored a pretty strong routine of coaching sessions with solution tree colleagues and bi-weekly check-ins via Google Meets with an agenda and kind of running a sequence of priorities. And so that routine is becoming more consistent and familiar. And um, at our district level uh, guiding coalition, We've been intentional about creating a space where folks can be candid and feel um, a level of trust to be able to discuss some of the challenges that we're encountering and then honor ideas from across the range of perspectives that are present um, in an effort to also model what we hope would be the collaborative level experience at the building and at the um, classroom team level as well. Um, 
And that is a work in progress, but it's been meaningful to bridge relationships that weren't previously in existence and um, will remain a high priority to um, reinforce and again, continue modeling moving forward as well. With that, I'll kick it over to Keith around other district level and building level wins for this year. Thank you, Carrie. Uh, continuing with what Carrie said, um, one of our first uh, year one wins was uh, our team, the district level guiding coalition team developed norms uh, by which we all agreed uh, to function so that we could maintain that collaborative uh, nature. Uh, we've started work on a playbook, which is a Google document that has links throughout, which is meant to be a, a one-stop shop for all things PLC, and it should guide us towards uh, greater consistency in how PLCs are administered around the district. Um, another thing that's in progress is a hub, uh, which will be a place for all educator-generated resources uh, to be housed and accessible by all teachers, no matter which site you're at. Uh, so that should help uh, all educators find things that are geared towards their subject level or subject and grade level. Some other things that we've done at the building level, guiding coalition level, is uh, the district has hosted six trainings uh, for the principal and educator co-leads. Um, some of the work we've done is just establishing what those principles around the guiding coalition are, um, how to select those individuals. Um, we've begun the work around essential standards identification, which uh, is work that's kind of been in progress for uh, many years and at different grade levels and different subject areas, it's at different stages of uh, completeness. And so um, hopefully we'll have a and we're going to talk about this a little bit more in depth uh, this Friday, a um, essential standard survey, which will help buildings and PLCs identify what's most essential for their grades and subject areas. Uh, we've also established a process to um, identify educator co-leads and the other guiding coalition members. And this is meant to be a two-way uh, input process. It's not just top down, it, it is bottom up. And um, currently 90% of our school sites have identified their co-lead and their building guiding coalition members. Thanks, Keith. And thank you for toggling to the next slide. Um, excited to celebrate the wins and also want to be able to model that same collaborative process we described earlier in being able to acknowledge some of the areas of challenge or limitation that we've encountered and recognize that um, both the wins and the challenges are part of what's driving work into year two. So um, in honest reflection, we recognize that um, even with the bolstered two-way communication mechanism and the opportunity to build additional context through the PLC Summit learning experience, we also recognize that this kind of uh, intermittent connection may not illustrate a full picture of the work that guiding coalitions and collaborative teams are engaged in. Um, and so we wonder what that might mean to inform more direct access for board members and or superintendent alike to um, plug into a building level guiding coalition meeting or observe on Monday PLCs on a more regular basis just to be a little bit more deeply rooted in the experience itself beyond just what's being reported um, from us externally. And then uh, I spoke to this a little bit earlier. We appreciate your flexibility and willingness to leverage existing assessment tools like iReady to progress monitor, but we also recognize it's also not a complete data picture of student uh, achievement or progress. And so um, with that narrowed scope that iReady provides and our five-year trajectory, we hope we can capture some improved and enhanced ways of progress monitoring um, student experience. Uh, as the common formative assessment process rolls out. Um, and then at the district level guiding coalition, um, we recognize that this two-way means of communication is one that is geared towards providing uh, decision-making input. But at this point in time, there isn't a firm or clear role for the district level guiding coalition to um, 
play or execute in district level decision making. And so we're seeking opportunities to clarify that role and ensure that the input solicited and gathered through um, our four teams of communication can play a more prominent role in informing decision making at the district level. And then um, we do have a relatively robust team, as I mentioned, that includes a handful of educators, building administrators, and district level administrators as well. Um, but the work of a professional learning community uh, lives and expands into a vast number of departments, even in a, or all the more so, I guess, in a large district like ours. And so, um, there's a need at this stage to leverage greater district capacity in support of the larger PLC system. And there are some key partnerships that we're leaning into and prioritizing in professional learning realm and curriculum and instruction realm, uh, to name a few. We've had some great collaboration from the communications department, both in um, messaging to staff, but also in developing the playbook that Keith mentioned earlier. And so there are steps taken, but more um, capacity to be built at this juncture. Um, and I apologize, Keith, I might have stolen a bullet point of yours, so I will kick it over to you next. <laughs> Quite all right. Um, continuing on with some challenges that we've identified uh, at the building level guiding coalitions. Um, at several of our meetings where we brought in co-leads, um, we solicited their uh, questions and their feedback about how the process is working, their questions. Um, what we've noticed is that there will continue to be a need to support uh, members doing the work, both the, the co-leads at buildings uh, but also now ramping up the guiding coalitions, which have uh, just been stood up. And so uh, that will require more professional learning uh, time for them to do that work, uh, compensation to uh, value their time and all the extra effort that they're bringing to bear. Um, we've also noticed some overlaps with the guiding coalition and other meaningful teams, which uh, our guiding coalition and co-leads have considered confusing. So it's unclear where we draw the line between like a school improvement team or an equity team or SBLT. Um, and so we're looking for greater clarity in, in that so that people feel like they're not being stretched too thin being on multiple uh, teams. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't see that last bullet. Uh, there one, the one last thing I want to mention is uh, we have noted uh, that while we have our guiding coalition co-leads and we've identified teams, um, how do you sustain that year to year? Uh, how do you either bring in new new people to reinvigorate the team or as people switch buildings? How do we continue guiding coalition membership so that it stays strong and doesn't fizzle out? That is something that is on our radar. Thanks, Keith. And thank you, Dr. Snell, for toggling forward. Um, so I mentioned at the outset, the successes and the challenges are intended to help kind of direct our focus into year two of implementation. And I apologize, we didn't call um, direct attention to it earlier, but on the right side of each of these three slides, you've seen reference to the five-year implementation plan. And so um, in the 23-24 school year, since we've done some training around guiding coalitions and started the training around essential standards work, the goal is to implement around those two areas. And then it opens up an opportunity um, over the course of 23-24 to begin training around uh, common formative assessments and what data analysis data analysis looks like for those common formative assessments as a part of the whole picture. Um, but headed into year two, we are eager to expand the shared learning experience for board directors and district level um, guiding coalition members in a, a second round of PLC summit experience. And so grateful again to um, Director Sproul's contribution and this uh, past school year and hope that there might be another board director to join us headed into the 23-24 year, again, to build context and um, more direct experience for y'all. And then um, knowing that iReady doesn't provide the fuller picture for student growth, 
um, our work towards common formative assessments with 23-24 being our training year is intended to kind of uh, build a trajectory towards an opportunity that allows us to report more authentic student progress over time. So thank you again for your patience with that process and then know that there is a shared acknowledgement of wanting to use more authentic uh, tools for assessment in that realm. Um, and then headed into year two at the district level, um, that same regular and agendized meeting uh, setup is something that we'd like to continue, but want to be all the more intentional than we have been previously around a sequence of learning experiences, because similar to the two-way communication mechanism, it, we've found it valuable to be able to engage in a mini learning experience as a district level guiding coalition that precedes the learning that might follow at a subsequent training for building level um, co-leads. And then that allows us to preview and fine tune, reference what might be a part of their experience and then brings things full picture back to the district level guiding coalition to better inform what next sequence um, makes sense. And again, leveraging that two-way communication mechanism is how we hope to achieve that. Um, so we want to continue modeling what a collaborative team looks like, and I know that Keith mentioned that we'd establish norms or agreements as to how we'll conduct ourselves in collaborative space. Um, but we want to make sure that at the district level, we have an opportunity to establish and then model the process for developing uh, mission, vision, and um, shared commitments. So that that work uh, it, with that sequencing in mind goes from district level guiding coalition to next steps for building level guiding coalitions as an anchor point for them in building to dive a little bit more deeper into the work at building level. And something else that we plan on uh, continuing to do in next year and in the coming years is to uh, update the playbook and the hub, which I spoke to on an earlier slide in order to keep those as living documents that uh, memorialize our progress and all of the processes that uh, we're generating to help support educators. Uh, we also want to utilize teacher voice by having them begin the process of identifying those essential standards across the grade levels and the content areas in which they teach. And that will be through a survey. I apologize, Carrie, is it Qualtrics or? Yeah, the Qual Qualtrics survey uh, was very robust, and uh, I know our ITS people have worked really hard at creating that. Um, the other thing that we're going to be doing in the coming year at building level guiding coalition level is helping the guiding coalitions create their scope and sequences for their building based professional learning needs because uh, each site we've we found is very unique in their level of familiarity with the plc process and uh their knowledge of guiding coalitions and so having them establish their scope and sequence what's most important to them in the moment is key uh, we also would like to solicit input from those collaborative team members as to how we address or you know and prioritize other committee work so that we can take things off people's plates and they don't feel like they're being overwhelmed uh, being on multiple teams at a building level. Um, we want to leave space and opportunity for um, board director or superintendent comments or questions at this juncture, again, to honor the two-way communication um, process. And then just wanted to recenter around this image we've shared previously because the five-year implementation process is intentionally slow and steady in an effort to um, you know, win the race this time around, if you will. But uh, I also want to give opportunity for Jim to chime in. I apologize, Jim, we kind of um, overran our slide deck. Um, but but if there are key components you want to make sure get captured, would invite Jim's voice into the space as well. Oh, thanks, Carrie. I was just uh, reflecting on um, this might be one of my best presentations I've ever given. <laughs> uh, uh, I, 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 I would just um, appreciate, express my appreciation for uh, Carrie's work as a partner in this work. Um, the, as an example of how far we've come as a district um, in the principal interviews that we've um, had this year, it's the first time as part of their core 
um, operating procedure or directions for their schools, multiple principles reflected on uh, the importance of a guiding coalition. And if you reflect on one of our first conversations in this year, we had most of our buildings that didn't even know what a guiding coalition was. So the culture of what we're doing um, has grown um, infinitely. It's, it's really um, kind of woven itself into the fabric of the work we're doing. And if you know, um, as many of you do as teachers, how hard it is to create culture, um, we have a great foundation that we've started. And a lot of that is um, due to the, the work of the district level guiding coalition that's modeled for, the, for our buildings, as well as the co-leads um, really stepping up, our teacher co-leads stepping up and partnering with their principals at the building level. So, um, so thank you. And thank you for the opportunity to continue to, to present in front of you and, and have this conversation. Thank you, Carrie, Keith, and Jim. Uh, questions from board directors? And this is, I think, maybe the third or fourth time that, that the team has presented to you as a board. So um, if you're tuning in for the first time, this is a series of presentations of just updating the progress. And we expect that as we head into year three, that those presentations will continue and opportunities for the board to interact um, as well. So, um, okay. Well, uh, Director Savala, is it okay if I move on to the next part of the agenda then? Just wanted to say thank you to Carrie and Keith and Jim for all your hard work. Thank you. Hey, I will reshare my screen and Mr. Blechschmidt is on here to walk us through some of the contracts that are up for your consideration at the July 11th board meeting. Um, and I'll just click Brett when you let me know. And um, as usual, you're welcome to interrupt us at any point or um, I know Brett tries to batch them together sometimes too by similar types of contracts. So um, Brett, it's all yours. All right, thank you very much, Dr. Snell. Um, so yeah, we have quite a few today because we have a lot of um, annual renewals that we can kind of do once a year. So um, I plan to go through very quickly because some of them are very routine and you've seen them year after year. Um, but as Dr. Snell alluded to, please uh, interrupt and slow me down as necessary if uh, you have additional questions or comments. So um, I'll jump right in. The first item we have for you to consider in July is a change order um, with Wildan Company, which is the uh, company that we deal with almost exclusively for HVAC work. Um, and so this particular project is um, to replace some rooftop units at Alki and Chinook. Uh, the funding source would be Capital Projects Fund or bond funds. Uh, the amount is $352,104 plus Washington State sales tax. Um, so again, we would ask that or recommend that you approve that change order to keep that work going. Um, the last thing I would say on that one is we have contingency built into, there's a whole series of projects that were funded through um, largely ESSER funding and bond funding. And so we have contingency that really offsets almost to the dollar this additional scope that's come into place. So. Um, it was a, it was an easier one for us to recommend knowing that we had a little bit of slack in that rope. So uh, pause really quick on that one before we get into some of the routine ones. All right, then the next six I have for you are annual contracts that we have for service providers. Um, I think exclusively in our special services department. Um, and so again, these are contractors that we've used in multiple years to fill in gaps where we can't, um, or it's not practical to hire our own staff to serve specialized student needs. Uh, the first one is an uh, independent contractor agreement between us and signing resources and interpreter, interpreter, excuse me. And as their name suggests, they provide um, sign language uh, interpretation and support. The estimated uh, contract for this for next year would be $750,000. And again, I'll just go through all of them and then we can pause at the end. Uh, the next uh, uh, specialized student services provider that we've used is, I believe it's pronounced Avena Healthcare. And Avena provides um, RNs and LPN supports for one-on-one -on -one nursing services. 
within our special services department. The estimated cost for 2023-24 for Avena services is $200,000. Uh, the next item is LSJ consultation. And as you can see, they provide uh, licensed school psychologist services. And the estimated cost for the year is 180,000 for that particular um, provider. And then the next one within that special service space is the Multnomah ESD, um, which actually operates Wheatley School, uh, which provides some highly specialized program programming for some of our students. Um, and the estimated cost for our access to the Wheatley School as operated by Multnomah ESD is estimated to be $161,700. And our last one within that special yeah, specialized services category. Oh, no, I take back, there's two more. Uh, second to the last one within the specialized uh, student services is ProCare Therapy. ProCare provides um, SLP, OT, PT, psychologist, and RBT um, services. And the estimated cost as needed for, uh, throughout the year, and the estimated cost of that one is 185,000. And then lastly, we get to Sunbelt Staffing, who also provides many of the same services as needed um, with the SLPs, OTs, PTs, psychologists, teachers, as well as uh, paraprofessionals. Uh, their estimated cost for the year is 300000 So I know that was a pretty quick dash, but again, I think these are all vendors that are familiar and services that we've used in the past, but I'll pause in case there's questions. All right, then we'll keep moving along here, whittling down the stack here. The next item is our recommendation that you accept bid number 2022-014 for the above ground lift installation at our transportation mechanics shop. Uh, this work was awarded in May of 2022. Uh, and it's been completed and, and fully satisfied based on the district staff and consult, uh, consultants that have worked on the project. Um, so we would recommend that you accept it as completed. The vendor was Northwest Lift and Equipment. And the final amount was $179,500 plus Washington State sales tax. Uh, the funding source on that was general fund transportation funding. Right, I'll keep moving into our recommendation to approve purchasing agreement number 2023-027 for kitchen equipment. And as you can see, the recommendation is for a number of equipment pieces, including pan racks, transportation or transport carts, and heated cabinets that we use to um, deliver and, and serve our students. Uh, the recommendation is to approve the contract to Edward Don and Company, and the amount is $72,942.18 plus Washington State sales tax. Funding source on that would be the General Fund Nutrition Service Department. Right, so hearing no questions on that, I'll launch into a group of another group of four that are kind of annual um, processes that we uh, approve in preparation for the 2023-24 school year. The first one is purchase agreement number 2023-026 for copy machine maintenance and repair services. And as we've recommended in the past, we are um, recommending to give that business to Pacific Office Automation again in the estimated amount of 150000 plus Washington State sales tax to keep all of our copiers um, up and running and um, serviced. The second in the series of kind of uh, annual operating expenses that we have is bid number 2023-021 for multi-purpose paper bids. And as we do every year, we typically solicit bids three to four times a year. Um, so we solicit your approval to go ahead and act on that um, authority throughout the year without having to come back each time. 
Um, and again, the reason we can't lock in the price for the entire year is that's a pretty volatile commodity market. And so the pricing does change throughout. So um, we buy as much as we can store, but that typically again re requires us to go out three or four times a year. The estimated annual cost of all of these bids would be $400,000. So again, the vendors would be awarded based on the bid conditions at that time. The next two in this series are both for athletic clothing and supplies. And again, um, annual processes that we do. Uh, the first one is approved contract number 2019-045-5. And this particular one is the um, last of a five-year contract, with, or a, a contract that we awarded five years ago with five annual renewals. Uh, this particular contract is expected to be for $150,000. And the vendor, I guess it's not listed there. Find the vendor really quick. Oh, maybe it is just miscellaneous vendors that yeah this is another one where we'll go out and bid um as we need to i believe oh no excuse me i'm sorry it's it's frank basher supply um is listed and you can see all the lines that they cover um on the recommendation form so i won't read all of the different um, particular manufacturers uh, and then similarly, we uh, recommend that you um, consider purchase agreement number 2023-024 to BSN Sports, also for uniforms and supplies and materials. And this would be the first year of the BSN contract. Um, and it is estimated to be for 300,000 per year with plus Washington state sales tax. And I'll just note that those last two for athletics, they could be both funded by general fund and ASB, depending on the purchase and um, what the uh, our traditional funding scheme is for those particular items within that general fund ASB space. So I'll pause for questions on those. All right, then the next one is another annual process that we ask you to consider each year, and that is, in essence, a lot of delegating the authority to um, the appropriate staff here at the central office to be able to manage our surplusing of inventory and materials. Um, as you can see, there's pretty prescriptive laws that we navigate as we surplus uh, miscellaneous materials, whether they're instructional or operational in nature. Um, so we certainly comply with those, but this res or excuse me, this action allows us to act on your behalf intermittently throughout the year without having to every month bring the list and not be able to act on it until you were able to um, authorize those surpluses. Questions on the surplus property declaration. All right, keep us moving here with three items that are originated in our ITUS um, department. The first one is for purchase agreement 2023-031 to endpoint security software. And as the name indicates, that is our virus malware, malware protection um, product that we use on our uh, network and devices. And the estimated cost for the endpoint protection licensing for next year is $287,160 plus Washington state sales tax. And next item within that UTS or ITUS, excuse me, um, group is purchase agreement number 2023-030 to Zendesk. And again, also, as the name kind of indicates, that's our help desk software that really does a few other things besides just track tickets. Um, as you can see, it's described as a comprehensive customer management workflow system. And um, our staff is recommending that we renew that contract licensing in the amount of $130,804.80 plus Washington State sales tax. And then the last within the technology group is a recommendation to approve purchasing agreement number 2023-029 to endpoint analytics. And what was posted to the um, committee of the whole 
agenda we would like to amend by the time it comes to the actual July board meeting because um, what was originally recommended for and posted to this agenda was just the um, the dashboard and student analytics visualization platform um, that would go to Synergy Analytics, which is one of the endpoint analytics products. Um, but since we published the agenda and sent the first um, recommendation, the team has also had a chance to evaluate the Synergy um, centered MTSS software package, and they are recommending that we also implement the Synergy MTSS as well as student analytics. Um, so the revised recommendation that we would ask you to consider at the July board meeting would be for both of those um, suites and functionality, and that would grow the five-year total from $493,313 to $857,799. Um, but again, that's over a five-year term. So the estimated annual cost would be $171,560 per year. And again, that would that would buy us both the student analytics visualization as well as the MTSS. So with all of that, I'll pause for any of those three um, IT based um, recommendations. Just real quick, I saw that on one of those IT, the sort funding source was the um, tech levy. And then this is general fund. Is there a reasoning behind the separation of the funding source? Um, the tech levy is within the general fund, and so they might have just been more specific on that. Okay. I'm not totally positive, but I believe the um, uh, synergy uh, work would also be funded by the tech levy. Okay. Um, so, but again, it, it was just a little more generic description on that one. Um, but we can certainly. Um, what we'll do is we'll update both, all the recommendations. So maybe we'll just say general fund dash tech levy to the right. when when tech levy is being um, utilized. Great, thanks. Absolutely. Um, any other questions on those three? I have I, I have a question about the synergy because um, I know we we got a lot of information about the kind of data analytics part of it. I guess I'm just wondering with the MTSS platform. Um, could we get some more information on kind of what it does? And I'm just wondering if that has been, um, I don't know, like if there's been any kind of feedback or if anybody has kind of analyzed it from the user, you know, um, if buildings are going to be using it to track, I assume it's to track MTSS data and interventions. I'm just wanting to make sure that it's kind of um, before we purchase it, it's gone through kind of people that are going to be using it have um, kind of analyzed it and it is, um, I don't know, we're, it's something yeah. that we have approved or that, you know, it's going to be user useful. friendly. Yeah, that's yeah. going to be useful because I know when we did that for the data piece of it or the student data, there were a lot of people that kind of gave input on on how nice it was. And I just, I know MTSS is kind of a big, a big thing. And so I just want to make sure if we're going to basically be doubling the amount um, that it's going to be um, used and worth the investment. Yeah, I think that's a very fair question. My understanding, although I didn't participate in that particular vetting process, my understanding was there were similar paths and similar vetting processes for both the student analytic data as well as the MTSS. Um, but maybe the best way to do that would be we'll have to prepare an updated recommendation anyway. And so we can certainly memo to you in advance of the July board meeting kind of an overview of that um, I keep saying vetting or review and, and consultation process to make sure that um, you all are comfortable with kind of how they navigated that. Would that be satisfactory? Okay, well, I can work with um, Dennis and his team to um, kind of outline that in, in memo form and we'll share that with you in advance of the July meeting then. All right, any other questions on the IT stuff? I don't wanna jump away from that conversation prematurely. 
All right, we're down to two more items. And so the next one on our agenda for today is the recommendation to approve the real estate purchase and sale agreement with the city of Vancouver. Um, this particular purchase and sale agreement um, involves a very small piece of property just in front of VSAA or behind, I guess, if you if you considered the um, the front to be the what fronts to Main Street there. Um, but the 0.15 acres, which is really right next to Shemway Park in kind of between the street and the parking lot. Um, obviously, we just redid that parking lot as part of this construction. And so it was not needed or useful in our parking lot or building remodel. Um, so the city has expressed a desire to kind of expand the Shumway Park um, into that. And so I think it's a win-win because they can do more with it. And then by not retaining ownership of it, um, not only do we um, collect 180,000 from the city, which is the fair market appraisal, um, but we also don't have to maintain that piece of property in terms of watering and mowing it. Um, so the city um, would just kind of have more continuity and, and more efficiency in maintaining that. So um, anyway, it's our recommendation that you consider that. As you know, with um, property sales, there's a pretty specific process outlined on the resolution whereby we're, we will advertise it and then hold a public hearing at the July meeting as well to hear um, sentiments from any interested stakeholders. Um, but it's our uh, recommendation that we move forward to that step. All right, then last but not least, um, the exciting world of hazard mitigation planning. Um, we're required based on the Disaster, Disaster Mitigation Act of 2000 um, to update periodically our kind of disaster um, plan with the Clark County Regional Emergency Services Agency. Um, and then there's a process by which it's approved by FEMA. And all of this obviously allows us to have the most cohesive response. Heaven forbid that we have some sort of a major um, crisis or event, um, but it also then also enables us to capitalize on FEMA funding if that were to um, present itself. So um, this particular resolution is kind of prescriptive based on the act itself. And as you can see, we've kind of navigated the process with CRESA and FEMA already. And so we would ask you to approve the resolution in July. All right, so that's a pretty quick dash through. I'm not hearing any other questions on that one. So um, thank you very much. Thank you, Brett. Um, and Brett, also in the July meeting, uh, can you just speak just briefly the budget process for July and August? Yeah, so um, we're frantically putting together the budget, um, certainly gotten the guidance from a variety of stakeholders as we've kind of navigated those critical decisions. Um, and you all have been very involved in, in helping us through that process. Um, so now we're in the process of putting it all together, um, both for a one year and four year viewpoint. And so our plan is to share that at the July board meeting in a summary level, just to kind of bring it all together into kind of that bottom line perspective um, and then uh, answer any questions or um, uh, respond to any feedback that you all might have. And then our plan would be to bring to August the resolution to adopt the budget. And that's historically also when we've advertised for the public hearing um, to uh, hear any last minute feedback from the public um, as prescribed by law for, for that before you would um, adopt the uh, budget itself and pass the resolution. Thank you, Brett. Any questions for Brett about that process? Okay, then Director Zavala, that is the committee of the whole agenda except for um, the workshop on strategic planning that will be at the Bates Center if um, anybody would care to join us there. Um, and I think we probably could get started. We're a little late, maybe 640. Um, we can get going on that if that works for people. Yes, thank yeah. you. As um, long as traffic is, hap is good. <laughs> just wanted to wish everyone a happy last day of school and have a happy summer. Um, and we'll see each other in September.
well, we'll still see each other because we'll still have board meetings, but everyone else <laughs> in August, September. <laughs> Thank you. It is 619. The meeting has ended. Thank you so much.